He was the rock star of the goal square. He had the good looks, the blonde locks and the exhilarating skills. There isn't a football lover who didn't marvel at his exploits in front of goal for Adelaide during the 1990s. They were amazing times, Tony Modra. Welcome. Thanks, Mark. It's good to be here. What are the memories? What are your memories of this? We loved watching you play. When I told people that you were coming on, everyone wants to see you and to see your highlights package. Uh, I think at the time I really enjoyed my football back then. I liked to give the crowd what they wanted to see. So if it was the odd mark or the goal, yeah, so be it. So The odd mark? <laughs> <laughs> there were three marks of the year and you were runner-up about ten other times, I reckon. Yeah, I, I, I guess so, yeah. I want to... I won a few cars. That leap that you had, just natural? I mean, I know you were a high jumper at school, but your ability to just, that vertical jump. I was, and I guess a few guys have got this sort of story as well. When I was at school, obviously you have the end end, end, end kicking, and I was a, sort of a, uh, one of the shorter guys at the time, because I didn't grow until late, and um, I was one of the ones, suckers up the front there that everyone used to <laughs> sit on, but that didn't last too long, and then I worked it out in the end that if I got up the back and, you know, had a bit of a jump at it, that'd be a lot better off. So. Geez, you squared up with a few blokes. Yeah, 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 I guess yeah. I did. Over. But the, the, the other thing about your game um, from memory is that as good as you were in the air, you were pretty competent at the ground level. You looked like a bloke who perhaps had a soccer background, did you? I did have a soccer background early. Um, I was, I was um, born at McLaren Vale and um, lived at Christie's Beach at the time with Nigel Smart and down there it was sort of soccer football orientated so I was sort of switched codes every now and then so it wasn't really until I moved to Loxton when I was about 10 or 11 that um, most of my mates were playing football so I tended to veer from the soccer away to football but it definitely helped me out I guess. AFL de Boone, not until you were 23. I was surprised at that. Was that. Why were you so late I know you played at West Adelaide, but yeah. why so late onto the AFL scene? Oh, because I guess it probably was, wasn't really my objective. I went down early and had a bit of a, a bit of a kick at Westies in my early days, under 19s and thing, things like that. But didn't really enjoy the lifestyle down there, so I moved back up home. And it wasn't until I was playing up there with my brothers and that as well that um, the odd person that ex, ex SNFL players were saying, "I'm wasting my talents up here. I should be somewhere else." Only eight games in your first year, 1992, and then yeah. you literally exploded onto the scene in 1993 with 129 goals. Yeah, I, I, it was funny. I, I, I had an opportunity in 1993 at the start of the year when Scott Hodges got injured, and I think we were playing the first game of the MCG against Richmond, and I got the call up then. So I guess I got the opportunity, and I, I took it, and um, yeah, it went on from there. 220 goals in your first 50 games. It was a massive start to your career, wasn't it? Did it sort of take you by surprise? Oh, I guess it did, but I was enjoying my football that much. And um, I guess at the time too, um, playing, playing AFL, AFL I, I was keen to you know, play against all these other teams that I used to watch on TV. So um, to get the opportunity to f not just play at home in front of all that crowd at Football Park, but just to fly interstate as well, because I'd never actually been in a plane before either. Really? Yeah, Is that so I know, true? I, know a lot of, I know a lot of guys these days, they whinge about getting on the plane, but earlier on for me, you know, jumping on a plane for me was <laughs> exciting, wow. so yeah. So you'd never travelled, you'd never flown out of Adelaide before you started no, playing no, AFL? No, not at all. We used to yeah. just drive everywhere as kids on holidays and things like yeah. that. So to get the opportunity to play at the MCG and you know, even Victoria Park back then. Mm. It was just a great opportunity. That, that adoring crowd that you had at uh, Footy Park, I mean, you must have loved that. Oh, I did. Though. I mean, they love, they love their football, and I think um, I found out in the end the reason why they came through the gates to watch you try and take those sort of marks and things like that. So I just, you know, pretty much did, didn't, he dis didn't hesitate to try and... Um, help him out in that regard, that's for sure. I reckon you've taken about 80 marks that would all uh, justify the title of mark of, of the career, but is there, one, is there one in your mind that you like better than any other? Well, I think the... Uh, I definitely like the ride I did in Brisbane up at the um, Gabba in 94, um, I think it was, but um, I think the one that probably stands out to everybody is the one in 93, and I think that started my career off, and that's what made me realise how much the crowd enjoyed that sort of thing, and... I guess at the end of it, um, when I took I took the mark, I sort of got the hairs on the back of their neck as well, watching mm. everyone around. You didn't tell us that, mate. Ninety three. Which which one was it? Ninety three was against North Melbourne, and I think it was on Ian Fairley and uh, Mark Micken was in the goal square as well. You went over the top knew, of Mark Micken. Yeah, well, and I knew Tony McGuinness because. Being a penetrating, he was outside 50, and I thought, well, he's not going to quite make the distance. He's probably going to land in the vicinity of the goal square somewhere. So I was prepared a bit of a run up there, and um, it wasn't until after I took the mark, realising how much Archer was you know, on my hammer there. So yeah. yeah. 
So did I was pretty you like it as market? I think. Did you use set out to use the bloke in front of you as the as the launching pad, or did you just have the ability to just go straight up? Oh, I, I think it definitely helped. Um, getting the timing and everything right, and I think as the years progressed, it wasn't a matter of just getting the timing right. It was um, trying to dodge and weave a few people in between mm, as well, because mm. I think they got wind that I needed to run up. So yeah, <laughs> you sort of had to have eyes in the back of your head as well. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. Now, you said how much you were enjoying your footy. I want to take you to the round one of 1994. Mm -hmm. You've come off 129 goals. You're a massive name in Australia, in, in football Australia. Mm. You're playing Carlton in round one. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Did you miss training on the Wednesday before that game? I don't think it was the Wednesday. I think I missed it on the last training session before, okay. that, before that weekend. And um, I th I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think they brought that season forward a little bit which um, interrupted my birthday to somewhat. So I had a few <laughs> mates come down and decide to take me out and just have a bit of a lunch before training that night. But unfortunately, one thing led to another and I um, yeah, made a few excuses why I couldn't get there. But um, I, I, I soon found out that I'd done the wrong thing because I got, I actually, Graham rang me up and found out everything that happened didn't drop me, but I think a few players were after me at the mm. time, wanting me dropped. So. Well, I'd heard that, that they thought, this is this is within days of the opening round of the season. It, it, yeah. well, it was, and, I, and um, just um, the attitude from the players when I got to the game that morning and in the change rooms, you know, it wasn't fantastic, and I knew I really had to try my hardest to... Um, to prove something to these guys. So, unfortunately, the day panned out well for me. I don't think it was until I kicked my 10th goal that Chris McDermott <laughs> came up, the captain, and decided to give me a hug. You so I kick kicked it. another three just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about the game against Carlton. Now, now, Tommy, we hear lots of stories, and you and I talked before we started about things that are fact and fiction. Mm. Did Cornsey and Bill Sanders, who was then CEO, come to your place after you missed training to talk to you, and did you say to them, I don't want to play football anymore, I'm sick of it? I was I was pretty keen to just you know sit back and have a bit of a bit more of a spell, but um, unfortunately you only get about well, it was about eight weeks back then off, so I think we get a bit more now, which I probably could have done with. So um, it was more it was more of those guys talking to me, and I think without their great advice, you know I could have I could have ended up going back home quite easily. So let's not labour the lunch, but were you partaking of alcohol at the lunch? Oh, well, I think that was the main reason. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we had a few too many throffies, but that's yeah. that's the way it is. And like I said, I'm, I'm glad everything panned out well on the day, but um, well, trust it me, it, does, it doesn't happen every weekend. It did pan out pretty well for you. So three or four days after this luncheon episode, you're playing against Carlton, you're playing on the fullback of the century in Stephen <laughs> Silvani, and you finish with uh, the Baker's Dozen, 13. I did, but I mean, Sausage Light here. this, I think I only ended up with seven on him before he got taken off me. He'd be so very happy to hear that. He <laughs> told me that they weren't all against him. And then you. I had a couple after him. I think Mill Hannah might have been one and a couple others maybe. I'm not quite mm. sure, but yeah. Have As you the day panned out, it went well for the day, but I wouldn't recommend it every, doing that every <laughs> week. And it's not exactly the right preparation. <laughs> no. Did, were you surprised? I mean, today, that, I mean, we, you would have learnt about the Gold Coast blokes being dropped for having mm. a drink. Were you surprised that you, you weren't stood down? Well, I think I was just lucky, and I think um, back in those days, even in the like, 90s, it's, there was a mentality and the culture that you sort of brought up with at the time. So um, I think I think now, obviously, the culture's changed a mm. little bit for the better. So for um, the better, yeah. yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Yeah. So that's just the way it was back then, and um, I was I was pretty fortunate to have um, a good coach in Graham Corns. Because Cornsey loved you, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, Bill Sanders was sort of my pre-manager at the time yep. with all the hype that was going on. So having having the Having the same guy who was also the general manager of the footy club, you wouldn't get that these days. <laughs> that either, I wouldn't think. Yeah. <laughs> Have you played a better game than that game against Carlton? Um, I don't know. I've kicked I've kicked thirteen a couple of times mm. here and you, there. But thirteen against Richmond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. I haven't really thought about it too much. But you must. I mean, given the level of opposition, I mean, the Blues were a good team, and Silvani was as good as fullback mm. as probably we've seen in the modern era. I think the North Melbourne game was pretty important to it, to us in '93. Considering where we were at the time, and I think we, I think we lost three in a row before that one, so that got us back on track. Mm. And I think um, I think we probably yeah we did we did rise a bit to the occasion after that mark too, and you know a bit of confidence um, went through the team from from that mark too. So Tony, I don't want to open up old wounds, but the preliminary final of 1993. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the score at half time? Yeah, I think we were six goals in front or something. Seven, seven was it? Yeah, mm. you kicked six. Yeah. 
the Bombers, for some reason, mm -hmm. um, came all over the top of you. I don't know whether it was because they were transformed or you blokes mm. did whatever you did, mm -hmm. but they beat you by 11 points and denied you the grand final spot. They did, and that's why I always think that, you know, back in then, you got to even take, you got to take your opportunities when they come. And unfortunately, we didn't take it. We, well, we took it for a half, but not the mm. whole game, and that's what counts. So, and I think to a certain point, I know Graham Corns probably wouldn't like me saying this, but Scotty Hodges was in the pocket next to me at the time, and I think we were working well together. And I think when he got taken off, pretty much after half time, um, I got double teamed to a certain point, which didn't help the cause. Did you see it coming, or when, when, when did the alarm bell start ringing for you? What, when the game started to yeah, turn in the yeah, last yeah. half, I think um, Watson had a fair bit to do with it yeah. as well. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, we're talking nearly 20 years ago here. So. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. You Unfor unfortunately, unfortunately, like I said, we didn't take the opportunity at yeah. the time, but we, we got that opportunity again in 97. 97, mm. 98, it's a long time ago, I understand that, but yeah. there must have been deep wounds for you there. You missed the 97 grand final because mm. you hurt your knee in the prelim. That's right. Mm. You're missing 98 for a story that was massive in retrospect. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mm -hmm. coach, Malcolm Blight, drops you after the first final yeah. and leaves you out of the grand final. Well, there was a pretty big build-up leading up to that because um, when you say I hurt my knee, I think it was back in 95 down at, down at Geelong, I ended up um, falling backwards on my knee then and at the time we got an arthroscope and they ta told me then I basically tore three quarters of my ACL. Wow. And um, we were trying to weigh up what we should do and the club recommended that, well, you might as well keep playing because you still had quarter left. So, <laughs> unfortunately... It, it could have lasted one more game in 97, but it didn't. Mm. So what happened in the Footscray game? It, 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 Western the, Bulldogs, yeah. Yeah, the preliminary final that put you out of the, 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 the grand final and ultimately the premiership. What happened? Well, from what, I, from what I remember was that I just went for a pack mark and then the timing was wrong. I didn't, you know, the, as far as the timing from when I thought I was going to land on the ground was a bit of variation yep. there and that's that's what caused it. Whether I land on someone else's foot, I don't know, but I just landed awkwardly on my leg and then it just went crack and I knew straight away there was, was, there, was yeah. a, there was a fair bit of pain there and I thought, yeah, that, I, think that's, I think that's my season over. Yeah. And there wasn't just me that missed out in 97, there were guys like Mark Rusciuto, yep. Peter Vardy, Matthew Liptak and maybe a couple others that we just wanted to, made a pat that we wanted to go ahead and do it again in 98 and when the time finally came and I didn't get the, I was probably the only one that didn't get the opportunity mm. or Lippy didn't as well, so um, you know, it was a bit heartbreaking but these things happen. They do, and I understand that, but they hurt too. Now, we're in September in 98. Yep. You've got this pact amongst you, those that missed out, that, to win the flag. Bloody the coach comes to you and says, mm -hmm. Tony, I'm not playing you. That's pretty much how it panned out, to tell you the truth. I mean, I got on well with Malcolm through 97 and 98, and it was just one of those, one of those um, days on a Monday, I remember it after the after the thrashing we got at Melbourne at the MCG that we come back. He called me into the office and basically told me the reasons why I wasn't playing, and they were pretty much what I was doing wrong in the back line and things like that. So um, he said I wouldn't be the only one, but what sort of frustrated me a bit more was that I was the, pretty much the only one. Mm. But anyway, that doesn't matter. I took one for the team, we won, so that's all all that really matters. That's not the first time you said that. You said you took a bullet for the team. Did you see it that way then? Because um, we are all, even though it's a team game, we are all selfish, aren't we? Well, it, 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 was, it was hard. And I mean, I'm not the only one to miss out on premierships. I mean, I'm pretty lucky to actually play in some in final series because a lot mm. of players don't even get to play finals. So I, I had, in 97, like, the only thing I missed out on there was pretty much a medal. I was there for every other occasion. Yep. I didn't play on the ground that day. So I was very lucky to be part of that. So with 98 and everything that happened and, and just having to sit down home down at Victor Harbour and watch, watch how the way the whole game panned out and not getting an invite to go go to the game or anything like you that. You didn't get invited of, to go to the game? Yeah, well, they, I think they were, they were just wanting to know numbers and things like that and <laughs> pay your own way or whatever. But anyway, I was, yeah, I was sort of feeling a bit down at the dumps at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. There, I mean, I'm not trying to get you to say that you were hurt, but I can't imagine that that didn't cut deeply. Oh, it, it, it did, but um, these, these things happen. You can't do much about it. How are your relations with Blighty? Oh, well, I think I, I saw him at the... Um, inaugural Hall of Fame earlier this year and said good day. So I mean, I haven't I haven't really spoke to him at, um, before then. I think that we had a reunion back um, in 2007. I spoke to him briefly then. Mm. And other than that, yeah, no, I, I, I got on fine with Malcolm pretty much through 97, 98. But like I said, hey, um, all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. So the end of 98. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michelangelo Rucci wrote a story that said that Adelaide wasn't big enough for both Malcolm Blight and Tony Modra. <laughs> now, I don't know whether that's right or not, but you end up well, going to Fremantle. I, I did. I, um, 
I ended up going there, and I know a lot to thank Fremantle for giving me the second opportunity to, to go and play over there. We had I had three great years over there, and stayed on there for a couple more. And um, then just um, you know, it was a bit far away from home, but um, we ended up travelling around Australia after that, and then moved back home to Victor Harbour. Why, why Frio? I mean, was there were you courted by Melbourne clubs at, at the end of your time in Adelaide? Um, well, at the time, uh, like uh, there were there were a couple of clubs that were sort of interested, but um, Adelaide sort of had a, had this deal with Fremantle, and it sort of worked him well. Like I did, like I thought, well, I had something to contribute to contribute with Fremantle at the time because they hadn't been there and done that. They were early club. You, you kicked 71 goals in your first year at Freo in a team that won five games mm. and finished about second last. Where does that sit in terms of your self satisfaction? I mean, that was a pretty good, pretty good return. Yeah, considering that they, they that the Adelaide sort of thought my days were numbered with my with my knee to to have a, have a, have not a bad year at Fremantle sort of helped a little bit. It just made 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 me think and show them that I wasn't quite finished mm. yet. So that that was good. Were you restricted a lot by the knee then? No, no, I was fine that year because mm. I think um, in two thousand. Um, I ended up winning the mark of the year again anyway, mm, so, mm. <laughs> so, so it was still yeah, pretty fine was by okay, then. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go back to 94 and um, that adulation and, and your your status in the city of Adelaide. Yeah. Cornsey all but said that you were as big in Adelaide then as Sir Donald Bradman had been. Yeah, well, that's probably a bit going over the top about all that sort of thing. So. Well, you can't get a bigger <laughs> accolade than that, can you? Yeah, well, well if, if South Australians love their football, so... Yeah. Did it trouble you, you know, when you were in the street or wherever you went out socially and people wanting to be seen with you or say hello to you, did that trouble you? Oh, I found it hard early. Sometimes they did um, get into your space a little bit. I know I had a few dramas there a few times following... following um, them following you home from training and then mm. not ringing your doorbell at midnight and things like really? that. But I mean, yeah, I'll, these things happen. I mean, you know, I got used to it after a while, so yeah. You got used to people ringing your doorbell at midnight, <laughs> did you? Yeah, yeah, I just disconnected it. <laughs> <laughs> Was, did you wrestle with the demands of the game at that time? Did you, you know, were they difficult for you? Did you just want to go and play footy and, and, and not have to worry about all the other well, stuff? Well, I think pretty much, like I said, as it was earlier on, when I was playing country football, which I loved, but I, I guess the discipline side of it got a little bit used to. And, um, and um, don't get me wrong, I was a hard trainer mm. whenever the balls were involved, not yep. so much the sneakers, but yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I guess, I, guess um, I sort of knew in my own mind when I needed a bit of a break, yep. because I think the most important thing with the football, even these days, the guy's got to be hungry to play. Mm -hmm. And if they're not quite hungry, well, you're not quite right, I don't think so. It was always, it's always going to be hard to try and get yourself up for a game and, you know, be really passionate and hungry about it. But I always think that you've got to look at yourself before anyone else as, as, as far as um, the way you're playing. But um, I, I noticed um, a few of the other guys, a few other players were struggling, struggling in that area and that something had to be done about it. So, yeah, that pretty much um, took care of itself anyway in 97 when Malcolm came on board. OK, so before that, was it a bit tedious? It, it was, and I, I didn't have a manager at the time, actually, in 90, um, in 95, because Bill was sort of looking after me a little bit, and that's where I think Rex Hunt came in and sort of gave me a little bit of advice on the side there and introduced me to his manager at the time. Mm. And he flew over a couple of times and we spoke, but I think he was pretty keen to get me out of the state and move on elsewhere, and that's when the opportunity, even back then in 95, 96, to go away to Brisbane and offering a fair bit of money back then and things like that, but I, I, I couldn't come to terms with wanting to leave Adelaide mm. itself as well, so um, we pretty much, I knocked that one on the head. So was, were you close? Straight away. Oh, not really. I mean, the thought was there and the money they were offering at the time, but I, I just, at the end of the day, I really got, there was sort of a bit of a media hype too about me going somewhere else to, which mm -hmm. I pretty much had enough of. So I think I just went in the office and saw Bill and I said, I've had enough of this, where's the contract, and just signed off on it. Do, do you feel fulfilled? You know, given, look, we all regard you as one of the great talents that we've seen play. But no premierships, and we talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that you've fulfilled your talent? Um, I... I think, I think, like I said, I didn't, I didn't plan out to go and play AFL football when I was younger. So I think I was pretty lucky. I was, I ended up getting the opportunity late in my career, and I did play ten, I think, ten years. Ten years, yeah. Ten yep. years of AFL, and I'm pretty happy where I'm at today. After the break, Tony, the lost art of goal kicking. I would, I suspect that you're empathetic with 
someone like Gary Ablett with all the pressure that was on him? I mean, you mm. were both uh, sort of everyone wanted a piece of you. Did, did you ever feel that way, that there were certain select few of you that just had to give too much back to the footy community? Oh, I didn't think that at all. I think um, part of the reason where I've got to today was because of the um, supporters, and that's why I love giving back when I can. Like, people, people, people say, you know, you spend a bit of time signing autographs, and even when I was coming to Melbourne, I'd spend a bit of time after the game getting on the bus signing, yeah. because they come to watch the game, they love their football, and they love seeing players play well. So I, I've, I've got all the time in the world to give it back to the supporters in that regard. That grand, We talked about the, the grand finals that you missed before. I have a picture, I think, of you running onto the ground after one of them. Is that right? Um, at 97, the end of 97. Was it 97? Yeah. yeah. You and, and Rue, Mark Rashida? Yeah, had, I think I had crutches on at the yeah. time, and yeah. I, I was in, I, a part of that was I was in a wheelchair too, which didn't help. I can I can still remember that after after the game, all the players, you know, I think it was in, I was 97, that time all the players got in the middle over and got a, got a um, photo after the game, so I was sitting on the side there, and I just thought, oh, well, there's something else you miss out on, so. In 93, Tony, we talked about you kicked 129 goals, but only 61 behind, so that's a conversion rate of 67%. Why can't blokes today kick goals from set shots? Oh, I'm not sure. I think um, when I look back in my day, I, I had a set routine and I pretty much stuck to it. I mean, there, some some days you have good days, some days you have bad. So, did you have I a know, bad day? Did you have a day when you just squirted them everywhere? Yeah, yeah, you, you did have those days, but um, you tried to work it out as the quarters went on what you were doing wrong yourself. And um, I think the I think these days sometimes you can get too much advice too in changing your routine because I think you didn't get to this level. Hmm. By chance. <laughs> with not yep. being able to kick. Yeah, so. yeah. What was your routine? <laughs> uh, my routine was pretty much um, walk in a straight line, make sure I had plenty of distance between myself and the person standing the mark, and um, obviously. The win factor and just um, pinpointing a kick to where I'd want the ball to sort of float. Mm. So it's similar to golf. Did you pick a target, a specific target, behind the goals? Um, I was more, I was more aiming, aiming at the goalpost. So I had a natural right to left. Yep. So depending on the wind and everything else, I'd pretty much aim for the top of the goalpost or something like that. The greatest goal kicker of uh, all time is uh, one Tony Lockett. Uh, what was your view of him? I mean, where does he sit in, oh, in your? I, 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 I really just thought it was a fair. There you are, mate. There's a, there's a nice memory for you. <laughs> oh, that was was that his, yeah okay. Was that his last game? Was it? I remember I, I saw him in his last game in in uh, um, Western Australia, and I just he was just sitting there in the middle of the ground, and he was just taking it all in, knowing was that he? he was never going to come back. So yeah. yeah, I just I just thought it was a great opportunity to play, be able to play on guys like that himself mm. and Gary Ablett. Yeah and even Jason Dunstall too. So have these sort of guys up the other end of the ground and people coming in through the gates to, you know, watch these sort of, um, how can I put it, they all wanted to see a goal shootout. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. that sort of helped me in a regard too. And they I went I, to see you, mate. None I'm of those folks to get as high as you did. No, no, no. But I, I mean, to just full forward against full forward and yep. seeing who could kick the most goals. And I don't, I don't know about the other full forwards, but, I, you know, I knew exactly how many the other guy at the other end you had. You did? Did you really? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> because it's interesting you say that because at the recent Hall of Fame, Plugger talked about competing with Dunstall and knowing where he was at and having this sort of competition within the competition? Yeah, so well, that, that, that was pretty much the mentality I had, and I think if maybe back then if I didn't have the opportunity to play against guys like this at the other end of the ground that set the bar level, set the standard so high mm. that maybe I might not have needed to kick as many goals. <laughs> See, it's funny, I, I could have believed you. If you had said to me you never knew how many you kicked during a game, I could have believed that. Yet you knew what the bloke at the other end kicked. Yeah, yeah. So you are so a competitive beast, was. don't you? Oh, for sure. I hate losing. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to Stephen Silvani uh, recently, just mm -hmm. told him I was talking to you. He's got a huge regard for you, as, he, as I'm not surprised at that, but he said, you're a very, very special player, and he thought you were cat-like. Now, we often think that Silvani was a bit like that. Cat-like, yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of your, your agility and, oh, okay. and, and keeping your feet and then sort of reacting quickly to the ground ball. He was very athletic as well, so we had some great duels together, and, I mean, like I said, of kicking 13 on him, it wasn't all, it wasn't all on him, and we, there were days where I, I probably didn't kick any on him too, so it was just great to be able to have duels with such great players such as Stephen. Who did you not want to play on, Tony? Was it one None of bloke? Them. <laughs> no one that. But ever... you always had to work out, work out a way on the day, and um, yep. some sometimes it went your way, sometimes sometimes it didn't. And obviously the ball, the way the ball was coming into, helps a lot. Yeah. Do you, do you subscribe to the view that it's difficult for teams 
to win premierships if they have a locket, a, a modra, an ablet that's the entire focus of, of the entries to goal? <sighs> These days, maybe. See, that was obviously... I, th I think that wasn't that Blighty's theory in 98. That, that he didn't want to just re rely entirely on, on you? Yeah, for sure, for sure. So that, that, was, that was the case, and it worked. It worked that year too. They won it again, so that, that was fine. I think um, after that, they might have struggled a little bit to find another goal kicker after mm. that. And I think um, I had the impression, I think, in 2000 or 2001, I ran into Neil Craig at the time in Melbourne Airport and was asking me a lot how, how Fremantle was going and, you know, Few other, few other things, and I got the impression then that he might have wanted me to come back and play with Adelaide mm. at the time. So, were you tempted? Yeah, well, I went, I went off after the conversation and sort of thought, well, I wonder if he's mm. implying that I, I could go back. But I mean, I couldn't do it to Fremantle at the time because um, they gave me the second chance. So you're doing, and you're involved with the, the Crows on Match Day, aren't you, in Adelaide? I am. I am. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I do. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a corporate figure there. I, I help in different ways. I host the locker room over mm. there where, play, um, where supporters can come down and watch the players warm up and have, mm. have a few beers and that and watch the game. So it's all good fun. And also I host the Crows Jet a couple of times a year to Melbourne, which is good fun to go to okay. too. That's, that, I think I read somewhere where you sent, there's a sense of belonging again now to that footy club that may have been tarnished on the way through? For sure, yeah, yeah. there is. And it's all, it's all gone and forgotten now. And, you know, I mean... The guy has to move on in a certain period mm. of his life. Otherwise, you're just gonna, you don't want to, you don't want to spend the rest of your life with a chip on your shoulder. That's for no, sure. No, you don't. You don't. You've got a son. Do you want him yeah, to play Luke, Luke's for... three and Haley's seven. So yeah. yeah, they're going great guns at the moment. Would you like your boy to play with the Crows? Oh, it's up to him. I mean, I didn't have any pressure on myself as a kid either. Mum and Dad used to let me do whatever I wanted to do. You know, I'd be playing soccer, basketball, cricket, whatever I wanted to do. And um, there's no pressure on him to do anything. He can do whatever he likes. So footy has been good in, in, in a real way, as in a practical way? Yeah, I, I guess so. And like I said, I wouldn't have definitely had these sort of opportunities if I chose the other path of just stay mm. play country football. But a lot, a lot of players that probably... There could be a lot of players out there that could have played AFL too but chose to stay home on the properties or just play country football mm. for the rest of their life. I guess I just got the right, ad, right advice at the right time and came down and gave it another crack and it, and it all worked in my favour. Tony, we've been trying for three or four years to get you on this program. It's been a great thrill to see you back and, and I will love watching the highlights again <laughs> because I think every football lover, as I said at the top, has just enjoyed watching you play. It didn't matter that you were in opposition colours, you're just a joy to watch. Great to see you. Good on you. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Cheers. This has been a Fox Footy production. Part of the Fox Sports Network.